The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Scott Bulch. He is the president of North Texas Bowmanite. They've been in business for um, 23 years here in the, in the North Texas area, but they also do uh, projects statewide and actually in surrounding states uh, to Texas. They specialize in decorative concrete. They also do some polishing concrete as well. Uh, so without further ado, please... Uh, help me welcome Scott Mulch. Thank you, Leo. Uh, as, as Leo mentioned, uh, we are contractors and we're installers of decorative concrete. That's our specialty. Bowmanite, if you're, those of you who are familiar with it, it's a network of contractors. Uh, it's the largest network of architectural concrete contractors. So we train, we develop specifications and and work uh, not only nationwide, but uh, but we're international as well. Uh so anything that we're going to talk about in the in the presentation today, uh, I'm I'm happy to. Uh, we've either can, we either have installed or we or we can install for for people that might be in the in the audience that would so desire. This is AI accredited, and this is our basic presentation on architectural concrete. Uh, and it's as we looked at you know all the elements that are involved. If there's a lot of a lot of people who had. You know, designers who had specific knowledge of certain aspects, whether it may be coloring, some imprinting, some doing other architectural finishes. And what we found beneficial was, as we went in and talked with these people, was to put together a, a program that would tie all that together and give you more of an analytical and a background as to how to develop your architectural system for your specific project. Again, the title of it is Color, Pattern, and Texture, a Concrete Surface Design System. Uh, we also, because it is AIA, AIA accredited, uh, uh, we're going to learn of the methods to manipulate and affect the color in concrete. We're going to have an understanding of the techniques creating pattern in co concrete surfaces, know of the process to articulate various textures, and then see how we integrate those into what we refer to as a surface design system. Now, while we're going to focus on three of those, there's actually four elements of artistic expression in, in architectural concrete, and that is color, pattern, Texture. And the final one is shape. And shape is the only element that we're not going to delve into in any great detail, but certainly most of you understand that concrete can be molded and shaped into almost any geometric configuration. So it's much more project driven. But uh, again, we'll take a look and take a look, closer look at color, pattern, and texture. We're going to take a look at color. And in terms of how we color concrete, I was going to skip the introduction to concrete. Probably a, a, for, the, for this crowd, that would be fine. In terms of the traditional aspect, the way that we looked at coloring concrete, it was primarily limited to, and I'm, I'm just talking 40 years ago, okay, prior to use of synthetic oxides and things like that to develop color. But it was primarily limited to colored cements, okay? So we would have a, you would have, of course, standard gray Portland, which is obviously still available today to us, or white Portland cement, which is still available and still widely used uh, in the architectural concrete uh, industry. There's also port standard Portland with light tints, and these, again, vary from shades of gray over to light gray. And, again, you can still get a few of these. And then there were special colored cements that were various shades of tan, and we might combine those as well. Probably the best example of that would be DFW Airport. Uh, DFW Airport was originally built with a lot of buff-colored cement that was uh, in, that was supplied by Texas Industries. That 
pigment, if you want to match that now, and what they've been doing to match that going forward is there's a synthetic oxide or an integral color that will match that. So, again, there's a, a lot more opportunities now as we take a look at what we deem as new methods of coloring concrete. And under the new methods, we have integral color, color-hardened concrete, antiquing release agents, and chemical stains. And as you, it's just as the name implies under integral color, these are your pigments that are introduced integral to the concrete matrix. It might be dosed at the batch plant. It might be dosed on site. Uh, trade names such as Schofield Chromex and things like that would be synonymous with, with your integral color. Again, as you, as you look at these, it's a, a textile. We utilize a lot of this in vehicular situations. If we're doing exposed finishes, we would utilize these. And as you can imagine, when we're using integral color, each one of these different finishes, and you'll see that they can take on a lot of different finishes, but these are separate pore components. Okay, so color separation, pattern separation very often, is, the, is created by separate pores and so forth. If we have a lot of vertical faces and vertical elements, integral color, again, is a great way to bring color into that structure. Our thin toppings. This is an example of our of the of the micro topping that's designed for exterior use. The majority of the thin toppings available on the market, whether it is a thin set, it's a three eight stampable overlay, the micro topping, or any of those in in between, are all integrally colored. Okay, so again, pigments that are mixed up and introduced integral to the concrete matrix. Structural concrete elements that you want to introduce color into. Again, integral color is a great way of doing that. We kind of broke it down into two different, for, for the most part, there's mineral oxides and there's color conditioned admixes, and really just to differentiate between those, you either have just raw pigments or you have an engineered integral colored mix that has some wetting agents in addition to some of those blended oxides. But at the end of the day, they all end up doing the same thing, and that is they add, add color throughout the entire matrix of the concrete. As you can imagine, may, maybe imagine, that Price is going to be driven by the intensity of the color and the depth of the section. So as you move up in color intensity, you're going to be driving cost. As you move, obviously, through the, a thicker section, then you're going to be driving cost as well. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these will, will also readily accept dyes and stains, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go through. But they can take on a lot of different finishes, can be util utilized interior as well as exterior, Almost without limitation, there's a few uh, integral colors who will not that will not stand up well to exterior color. So again, that's integral color. The next uh, coloring system we're going to take a look at is color hardened concrete. Okay, this is the color that's broadcast on the surface of the concrete. You place the dry concrete between the I'm sorry, the uncolored gray concrete between the forms. You would screed it and float it. Add the the color in two applications, usually about two-thirds of it in the first and then followed by a by a third. This is, you're adding, in the color hardener is a makeup of silica sand, cement, and pigment. Uh, so this is how the majority of the architectural concrete work that we do is done. It's the most economical way to color concrete because, again, we're simply coloring the top quarter inch of concrete when it's in its plastic stage. It allows for doing multiple colors and multiple patterns in uh, uh, the same pore. You can create, for instance, soldier course like this, and this field were all poured at the same time, and just through techniques of doing color separation, we added the darker brown color to the soldier course, added the tan to the field, imprinted it with two separate patterns, eliminating the need for, for a construction joint there, as you would have had to have had if you had poured this out of interval color. Widely used in all pedestrian applications uh, and light vehicular applications. Color hardener is uh, very applicable. Uh, and color hardener can also be utilized in vertical faces as well. Uh, step facings, uh, pool copings and so forth, uh, all can be colored uh, very nicely with color hardeners. They can also be hard troweled and carried on an interior slab that might uh, eventually be scored and, uh, and polished up. Antique and release agents. Again, we so we're still taking a look at different methods that we use to affect the color in concrete. As part of the imprinting process, when we emboss or stamp the concrete, we have to use a release agent to, one, keep the concrete from adhering to our tools, but secondly, 
by pigmenting that release agent, we can add a highlight or an antiquing color to it. So when you're looking at specifying and working through uh, imprinted looks, there's really two selections of color you're going to make. You're going to make a base color selection that may be integral color, might be a color hardener. That's your base color. And then your antiquing release agent. So a look like this would be, a, this pool deck would be achieved by taking a sand colored color hardener, placing that on the surface of the concrete, again in two application while the concrete's plastic, and then at uh, right, precisely the right time, right before you get ready to imprint it, we're going to broadcast a dry powdered release agent across the surface of that concrete. And once again, that allows us to emboss or stamp that concrete and keeps the concrete from adhering to the tools. A couple of days later, after the, the, the deck is stamped, we're going to wash the majority of that release agent off. But because that release agent contained a pigment, it's going to antique the crevices and the low parts of that texture. So whether it's a slate texture, a stone texture, a used brick texture, that little bit of antiquing is what creates that variegated look across there. And antiquing release agents can be very light or they can be very contrasting in color. They can also, we can also use the antiquing release agents to variegate. We could use more than one color across a surface to variegate that surface and to create depth to that surface. But all very important part of the imprinting or stamping process. The other way that we could affect the color in concrete, the, the first three Systems we've looked at are all done when the concrete is, is plastic or being placed. Chemical stains are all done after the concrete is cured, either from a short period to a longer period of time, depending on uh, uh, the coloring system that you're using. But we break these into two categories, reactive stains and then penetrating stains. And reactive stains are your traditional acid stains. You're all probably very familiar with them. Your earth tones, your browns, blues, greens, and so forth but of limited color palette because there's only a limited number of metallic salts that are available that are suspended in an aqueous solution. There, again, the reactive stains can be used to color entire areas or to simply add highlights to an area. So a look like this would be achieved through imprinting a pattern, possibly in a light tan or sand color, and then going back with a black and a couple of shades of brown, maybe in different dilutions, and hand antiquing those stones to get that look. A look like this is achieved, if you see the, the olive colored accents in there is, you would place and color and imprint that pattern, obviously when the concrete's still plastic in that gray, and then come back a few days later and add the olive colored as a stain to accent that. So that's how the chemical stains, reactive stains, are utilized in ac accenting that. Reactive stains also work very well on, on vertical elements. Uh, you, whether it be cast in place or or precast elements. They work very well on that as well, if you're looking for a natural look. Most of the time when you're doing, when you're staining, as you've seen, there's some exterior as well as interior applications. This is a coloration system that spans both of those. Most of the time when, we, when we're installing a, a stain application, we're doing color separation with a saw cut or a score joint. Okay, that allows us to stop the bleed of one color to another. We might go back and, and caulk that joint. We might caulk it with a contrasting. We might caulk, caulk it with a complementary grout. We may not caulk it at all. It, it simply depends on how we, uh, how what the design calls for the design elements. You can see that uh, here you've got some decorative saw cuts where we did not where it did not get any caulk to treat that that score line. It just simply remained untreated. If you'll notice with the reactive stains, the variegation in the color, uh, in the modeling of the color, and that's one of the desired characteristics of, of the reactive stains. Uh, as you'll hear about a little bit later with the polishing, reactive stains can also be utilized with the uh, polished concrete techniques. These are all traditional. The images you're looking at here are all traditional stained products, stained floors, or stained exteriors with a sealing system over it, a topical sealing system. We also utilize the, the reactive stains to create logos. So everything about that, that logo there is done with those the, the variegation. All that coloring is done with reactive stains or acid stains. So, again, almost anything in terms of, of design capabilities can generally be achieved in terms of coloration with uh, with reactive stains. This is the KD Mills Mall down in Houston. Uh, all started out as gray concrete. Lots of gray concrete poured through all the common areas. Graphics were overlaid through the use of uh, microtopping and acid stains.
talk a little bit more about the microtopping in a minute. But as you can see, you can create uh, very vivid graphics with those by simply doing color separations. So all of the components of that color across that concrete, that gray concrete, was all done with acid stains and sealed with a topical system. And you can see just the, uh, you can see the, the control joint pattern that was introduced into the slab, but the graphics overlay over the top of that. Borders and so forth and elements are all, we, we, we enhance those and create those with acid stains as well. And there's also precast elements that can be done, you know, from countertops to, to conference tables and things like that. Penetrating stains are the other side of the stain equation. And these are the, the same synthetic oxides that we use, to, very similar synthetic oxides that we use to color the concrete that are ground much, much finer. And by opening up the pores of the concrete and using, utilizing a carrier, we can introduce those stains we can, into the concrete. They have limited use. So we, all, we want to only use these on pedestrian applications. They're not for vehicular applications. Uh, and some of the colors you have to be careful of how to handle them, blues in particular, uh, in, uh, in situations where there are UV. So those are some what we termed the, the new methods of coloring concrete. Let's take a look at some of the additional ways that we affect the color in concrete. We do this through overlays and toppings, protective treatments, finishing, and exposed aggregates. Overlays and toppings, by far one of the areas we're seeing the greatest growth in, in, in our industry. Lots of demand for going into existing spaces where the concrete is not in suitable condition to either put a polished floor on or to put a stained floor on, so we want to do a topping. Uh, so the technology's actually been there. Frankly, we've been doing it for almost 20 years, but now there's a lot of engineered bad bag products out there that create uh, great, great looks. As I mentioned, all of these are, are uh, integral, are typically integrally colored, and then we can utilize a lot of the same patterns that we would to stamp these. So again, we're still looking at the ways we can affect the color in concrete. We could put that through a 3 8 topping system. We could put that look in this space right here. We could pull up the carpet. We could we could do a, a remove the carpet mastic. We might have to push down at some fixed elevations, and then we could put a 3 8 inch integrally colored topping and put that finish on it in this space. This is the use of the microtop system. Okay, the microtop system, as as the name denotes, is, is a thin layer of concrete. Typically it's in the 20 to between 20 and 30 mils thick of concrete. Thickness of a credit card. Okay? But it's integrally colored concrete that's troweled down, troweled down in application. So the requirements of this project, this is a residential project with an Italian theme, and the architect was looking for a cream-colored floor. The, the slab was already in place. Gray slab was already in place. So no cream-colored stains are available, or off-white stains are available. So the solution was a microtop. Come in and trowel down a, a thin concrete coating, coating in very thin layers. And as you can see, uh, it also got a decorative saw, saw cut on that as well. As you can imagine, the microtop, this is uh, some architects in uh, Boca Powell's old offices over off the old uh, the toll road. The requirements, or their requirements for a floor drove them to the microtop for color selection. They were looking for some grays or light grays and some darker grays as part of the color selection. But also, this was on the third floor, and as you moved out towards the curtain wall, the slab was not finished very well. So they had a couple of challenges going in to the job that, that precluded them from using a traditional acid stain, which we were originally called to do. So again, the, the fix for that was the, the microtopping, because the microtopping also, because it's a topping, allowed us to remedy the problems with the, of the poorly finished concrete up next to the curtain wall. And again, as you can see, this and also got where the color separation was. That's a thin saw cut. It typically gets grouted, and in this case it was grouted with a a uh, complementary, uh, I'm sorry, a contrasting grout. And as you can imagine, because we're working in a medium that's only 20 mils thick, there's really not enough opportunity to create texture in that. The texture that, that is that's that is able, you're able to create is by the troweling or the skip troweling or the very thin layers of concrete that's pulled over the top. So not an opportunity to create, for instance, a stone texture or anything like that. This was an image of uh, Citizens Communications up in North Dallas, and part of the requirements for this project were 
This is the transition strip. This is a cafeteria, by the way. This is the transition strip, and this is carpet. So we were simply given carpet swatches, and we were asked to match those. So this is the microtop version, or a concrete version, of the topping that matched this color. And you can see this as well as, as here. And it, that happened throughout this, this project. This project was, this building was sold about six years ago. We installed this about ten years ago. And this building was sold to PepsiCo. They asked us to come in and, and, uh, re you know, take a look at it and refresh it. You might be thinking, well, how, how long is, is a thin topping of concrete, the thickness of a credit card gonna last? Well, the answer to that is, when it's properly maintained, it does very well. Uh, this was, the only area we had to do any repairs was in front of the cash wrap, where, or the cash register where people would check out. So the rest of this all looked good, no repairs, it was simply thoroughly cleaned and then resealed. Any color, micro toppings, any color in a Pantone chart. So one, that's one, another reason that it's a very desirable, uh, topping system. So designers can come through with, with either paint chips or in this case, the actual swatches of the carpet and we can pull in coloration systems to match that. This is another image of the, again, we're still looking at ways of affecting the color in the concrete. This is another image of the Katie Mills Mall. Again, we had, what we were given when we walked in were gray concrete corridors. So all the green that you see in there is, is a traditional acid stain. But because of, of color choice, the stick figure and the lightning bolt were done in the microtop. Okay, so, and remember, the microtop is going down 20 mils thick, so there's no reason to depress a slab or to recess it to add an architectural concrete topping system like this. It simply trowels over that gray slab, and it's separated by a saw cut, and because it's only 20 mils thick, it doesn't create any type of trip hazard. So again, color choice drove those. And we do, we see the industry a lot of times driven by uh, color selection utilizing a thin concrete topping like that. Uh, to do logos and so forth, uh, it's a, the micro topping is a great way to, to put them in. And again, this is still a polymer modified con cementitious material. Question? So I was going to say the financial was under. Yes. Yes. Typically, we're bringing, there, there's a few exceptions to that. Uh, if it is a, if, if it's a saw joint that, that, that has never reacted, okay, say we're going in on a 10 year old building and it didn't, it didn't crack, okay, but, and so we want something to, to, we don't want to honor it for whatever reason. Maybe it, it interferes with the decorative pattern. Then we'll do a crack repair over the top of that. Do a, do a woven fabric with an epoxy to bridge that. And we actually have very good luck with that with even joints that have reacted. Expansion joints though, you know, anything like that you're going to want to honor. So if there's an opportunity to honor it, then it's better to honor it. If, if we're trying to bridge it though, then we, usually have pretty good success with a creating a uh, a patch across the top of that, a, a isolation patch. You can see the other thing to notice about the variegation of this color is as you as, you, as the gray, particularly noticeable in the gray, unlike an acid stain, which is a chemical reaction that gives you your modeling, your movement and color with a thin microtopping is created by the way the material is applied and troweled down. So the, the pressure of that trowel, just like it creates a difference in a hard trowel slab, the pressure of that trowel also gives you that variegation in, in that as well. Again, going back to this is Great Vine Mills Mall, you might be thinking, well, how, how long is this stuff that's the thickness of a credit card going to last? And that was, this is one of the first installations of, of Microtop in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's been down uh, at least 14, 15 years, and the, we've never done a repair to the uh, entertainment corridor, we have done some repairs to the tenant spaces as they have moved in and they've changed uh, the dimensions and the, the storefronts and so forth. There's also an exterior version of this as well, and, uh, and and so you can carry these same design elements outside. And again, if you try to create this out of a traditional concrete construction where you'd have separate pore components, you can imagine that those thin orange ribbons through there would have had a lot of cracks in them. So what you do is you're able to still honor the your joint system that was created to control that, and then your graphics simply overlay over the top of that. 
But for doing logos and so forth, it's, it's a great way with thin toppings to do that. Protective treatments, won't delve into this into any great detail today, but just understand that the sealers that go on top of the concrete are going to affect the color. Whether it's, whether it's acrylics, polyureas, polyurethanes, epoxies, or whatever it is that you're utilizing to protect that, it's going to ultimately affect the color in the concrete. Let's take a look at how finishing can affect the color in the concrete. Through different finishing techniques, you can also affect the color in the concrete. Exposed aggregates, another area that we're seeing tremendous growth. There, there's a lot of opportunity now. There's, there's a lot of good manufacturers, particularly in the Texas area now, coming out of central Texas with a lot of decorative aggregates that are graded in size and colored and work very well. So a lot of opportunity to, with a lot of different types of decorative aggregate from glasses all the way through, uh, you know, other, other materials that will affect the color. Let's take a look now at the ways that we f affect the pattern in concrete. We've taken a look at the first component, which was color. Let's see how we can affect the pattern in concrete as in an architectural concrete installation. Some of these same categories, as you'll notice, will also affect the color. And you'll see that they'll additionally will affect the texture as well. So we kind of categorize that into imprinting, stenciling, multiple colors, joining, sawing, scoring, finishing, exposed aggregates, some form liners, and then what we deem just handcrafted patterns. You know, there are literally, with all the manufacturers that are out there, there's hundreds of imprinting patterns now. Lots of manufacturers that create tools that will that will emulate either stones or bricks or uh, or other natural materials when, when they're imprinting with them. So there's lots of opportunity with different imprinted looks. Wood patterns. Uh, we have we have People come to us that want the feel of wood, they want the look of wood, but they do not want the, the maintenance. Theme parks like Six Flags and so forth has installed this uh, throughout it. This was a, uh, looks like a, a zoo, I think this was the Oklahoma City Zoo. We have boards, we have wood, we can make it look like any color of, of wood, obviously through any of those coloring techniques we talked about earlier. Uh, but, the, but again, the imprinting of this, we have 4-inch boards, 6-inch boards, 8-inch boards, 11-inch boards. We can be done in different lengths. So anytime just a feel of wood is, is desired, you can see where the coloration could could uh, bring the particular color into effect. Uh, both the banding in this pool deck here, both the banding and the 12 by 12 slate are all created with uh, imprinted looks. Additional thing to note in this particular imprinted uh, look is that 12 by 12 pattern is also grouted. So... Just like you would grout a tile, once we emboss the concrete and create that geometric shape, we can also go back through and grout that pattern as well. Combination of, this is an ash for slate over a large field, separated by some borders and some bandings. You know, the, the, not only is the, as you look at large expanses of architectural concrete and, and imprinted concrete in, in particular, Breaking that up with uh, different patterns not only adds interest to that, but it also adds to the the, uh, the overall ease of which it's installed. And there's also custom patterns as well when we're looking at imprinting. Okay, so that was imprinting, if, how that affects the, the color. Let's see how some multiple colors also affect pattern. We're talking again how we're affecting the pattern in an architectural concrete. By simply... Bringing in and utilizing different colors, multiple colors in a geometric configuration, we're also affecting the pattern. This is that, that microtop product on an exterior, but again, the, the multiple colors is what creates the pattern in this element. Interior stained floor, where again, in this case, the, the, one of the color, the color pal palette in this was the gray concrete became one of the color components. So, we only, there was only color introduced in Approximately half of this job as the stain was. Still looking at how you affect color. Just as we mentioned previously that there was, you know, the integral color you, you, as you drive, as, as most projects, as, as you drive complexity, you're going to drive price. Uh, that image before of that, of that classroom with the single color of, of stain scored the, in the manner that it was, uh, that is, in the Dallas market, that's probably a $4.50 a foot. Four, four to four fifty a square foot floor installed. That's your scoring, your prep, your scoring, 
your coloration system, laid it out, your coloration system, and your sealer. That's probably a $6 a foot area, okay? We've driven complexity. We've got a more detailed design. We've brought in more colors. We're driving complexity. We're in, hence we're going to drive cost. This is all, these are all accomplished with, these, these were actually installed prior to the concrete polishing, uh, even being around. And so I won't take any of the, of your next speaker's, uh, uh, talk, but there, but you can create a lot of this with, uh, with pop, you can create a lot of these graphics with polished concrete now as being the, the system. This though happens to be protected with an acrylic sealer. This would be, this acrylic sealer would be maintained in the same manner that a VCT floor would be, for instance. It would have a probably a couple of, of, of applications of a sealer, water-based or solvent-based sealer, protected on top by some waxes, but really those are acrylic products. And it's those sacrificial waxes that the janitorial staff would periodically, maybe on a, a mall like this, they might strip it annually and reseal it. So uh, it's, it's got a, an acrylic sealing system on it. Whereas the polished systems, they're all internal in nature, your, your sealers. So all of these images are of topical sealers. Same way as, as this is as well. And most of that technique that you will utilize to create pattern on the interior can also be utilized on the exterior. We just simply don't do it as often, but it's the same techniques that uh, you can you can lay out and uh, utilize and utilize to do exterior installations as well. Let's take a look at how joining, sawing, and scoring affect the pattern. These have been, you know, time-tested techniques for uh, uh, not only, uh, you know, control joint control and so forth, but uh, also to create a decorative element. They've been around uh, a long, long time, and they still find their place uh, in architectural concrete. The stone, the, the steps and the border that look like a cast stone or actually cast-in-place concrete that was tooled, in a manner that made it simulate cast stone. So again, an, an example of how joining and uh, sawing and scoring. Again, there's a reminder when we're doing interior stain work, most of the time when we're doing color separation, we're doing that with a saw cut or a score joint. So that can also add to the architectural interest of that installation as well. Finishing. We, we saw previously how finishing can affect the color. We'll take a look at some examples of how different finishing techniques uh, can affect the pattern in the concrete as well. Uh, and it, that depends on taking elements like this and etching them and exposing uh, the concrete at a different rate will create a pattern across that concrete. This is, of course, a combination of, of seeding, but then once the decorative aggregate was seeded into the matrix of this concrete, it was exposed through a technique of finishing to create the final look. Exposed aggregates, you know, exposed aggregates, uh, 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 you've seen they can affect the color by selecting different aggregates, but the way those aggregates are placed in the concrete, they could also as well determine pattern in that. Four blinders. I don't have, won't delve into this into any great detail, but I think you probably all embrace that, uh, you know, form liners find their place in creating pattern, uh, in, in a lot of architectural, uh, situations. And we have to marry our, our architectural flat work with that very often. And then finally, just handcrafted patterns. This is kind of just a catch-all category for things that wouldn't fit in some of those other uh, major categories, uh, but again, we're still looking at how how we can create pattern in a, in a floor. This is an example. Go back to the microtop. This is uh, in Dallas at uh, uh, Campbell Center. Uh, they've just recently moved. I understand Pegasus Solutions occupied about four floors in that uh, building, and we were the requirements of, of the project were for us. They do biz, They do business all over the world. And in all the countries that they, the various languages that are spoken, they wanted uh, they wanted to put on the floor. So, th as we got to this project, it was uh, it was on the metal pans. So we added a polymer repair mortar to bring us up to grade. All the concrete had re been removed off of these off of this deck, this elevator lobby. We used a polymer repair mortar, polymer modified concrete, to bring it up to grade. 
And then we added a microtopping to the surface of that, and that's the gray color that you see in the background is a gray colored microtop. And the, and the lettering that's overlaid over the top of that is, is microtop as well that we trial down to a stencil. So that's, those are not vinyl letters or anything like that. That's a concrete topping that's trialed down into the floor. So as you can see, you can get very detailed with that. Uh, this was uh, Benny Hanna's in, uh, out in Las Colinas. The requirements of the project is you came in the project and had a traditional 12 by 12 slate pattern in front of the of the bar and in the uh, in the lobby area, but as you turn and went down the dining hall, the illusion was to create a river where the tiles were coming loose. So the the tiles were adhered to the to the slab on grade, and the tiles because it's a a three eighths material, a, a polymer repair mortar that was integrally colored was troweled down between those tiles. Those tiles were subsequently etched to give you the wave to to have the the uh, to have the uh, illusion of movement in it, and then finally a stain was washed over the top of it. Once again, we were, as we were talking about complexity, this was probably a $20 a foot floor installed. Again, just the microtop and handcrafted patterns, uh, that's all done with concrete, all done with thin toppings. Other handcrafted patterns that can be created are through the through etching or template sandblasting. Great way to create uh, lettering or other graphics on exter on exterior applications is a change in the texture. If you had said if we had created a mock-up like that, an architect or engineer had looked at it and said, you know what, said said I love that, but I want the letters to read. I want them to be more vibrant and to, and to, and to read stronger. In this manner, this was etched. The letters were, were masked. The background was etched, and then a stain was washed across the top of that. You could have introduced the stain first and then blasted away or etched away the backgrounds to where the letterings would have been the uh, caramel color or the, or the brown color, and the background would have been the gray concrete, and that would have been a stronger read on the lettering. So... Very, just the way some of the processes come together, whether you're etching and the way you layer these systems, ultimately will affect that depth to which you see or to which your graphics read in your architectural concrete. And anything from mild to wild can be done. We've had people bring us, uh, this happens to be a border that's in our office, in the lobby of our office, but we've had people just bring us images out of, out of books and magazines, or they come up with a custom logo. You know, for a lot of themed places, they come up with custom looks, and obviously through, di you know, digital enhancing, we create stencils or whatever we need to do to overlay that over the uh, concrete. The leaves that you see in here, uh, again, if you look at the just process and procedures for something like this, we have uh, uh, a rock salt concrete background. Uh, so obviously that rock salt was uh, introduced at the time the concrete was plastic. And then those leaves were, were etched through there. So then you had to go back and, and etch those leaves in after the fact. A look like this is achieved, though, in creating the, the leaf pattern and the footprints are all introduced into the concrete while the concrete's still plastic. So, and then the stain is washed across the top of it. The coloration system was washed across the top of it. So the, the fern leaf that's introduced at the bottom and the other texturing and imprinting is, comes in when the concrete's plastics as is the case there. And then again, a background, you're again, you're, la you're layering complexity here. If you look behind the fern leaf, you have an earth texture in a seamless skin. So that was initially introduced as an earth texture with a seamless skin with that patterning, and then the fern leaf was, was put in over the top of that. And then if, you, if it's so desired, once you create that pattern in the concrete, you can enhance that with some of those staining techniques that we talked about earlier. The last thing that we're going to take a look at today is see how we introduce texture into the concrete. So we've looked at color and pattern. And again, you see some of the same categories that we utilize to create texture. Texture, though, can be created a number of ways. It can be created when the concrete is initially placed and when it's plastic. Or it can be, texture can also be brought in through the use of sandblasting or etch, etching later after the concrete's uh, already poured. This is a great example, though, of 
the landings here between the these exterior stairs steps have uh, have imprinted concrete, and then you have broom finished steps, and then you have sandblasted a sandblasted plaza down here that uh, a little bit of staining's been done to accentuate that. So again, finishing has created the texture across that, and and there's certainly nothing wrong as you see introducing those different textures into the same area or the same space. The manner in which we expose or, or maybe remove some of the cement paste from the concrete through mechanical uh, means can also create texture in that concrete. If you look across a fully exposed area, again, these are exposed concrete. All this concrete started out to have a cement paste across it, but through exposing some of it through a template, and then doing a less a, a minor exposure through here and separating that with saw cuts, that texture is creating the pattern in the concrete. Example here, you have a uh, stone texture that uh, surrounds the outside with a picture frame trowel. And I know it doesn't read very well, but this is a light etch uh, panel here in the middle. So again, different techniques of finishing to create different textures in the concrete. An example of, uh, again, of different textures coming together, slate textures that are separated with, with different colors, and then float finishes with some picture frame troweling that happen to also coincide with some, some joining as well. Hand, uh, hand troweling or hand, hand floating textures in. This is an example of utilizing a, a rock salt, and then they overlaid a, the coloration system was a stain over the top of this. But again, we're looking at the ways the fin finishing create, can create the texture. You know, exposed aggregates, uh, we saw how the exposed aggregates can create different color by the, by the changing of different aggregates. By the different, by the sizing of those aggregates, then you can also affect the texture in the concrete as well. And there's a lot of different methods to uh, to doing that. Some of the aggregates, the decorative aggregates, can be introduced into the concrete matrix when it's poured. And maybe it's an over-rocky mix that's poured with that decorative aggregate and exposed. Uh, it could also be something that, in the uh, example here, is, is a, a seeded. So the gray concrete or the colored concrete was placed between the uh, the forms or the, or the bands in this case and screeded. And then at some rate of application, the decorative aggregate was seeded into the surface of that. And then the, the timing of the, removing the cement paste from the aggregates exposed that. Uh, we're finding that a lot of interest in this right now in the design community. You know, in, in, as I talk about exposed aggregates, a lot of people that have spent any time in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you traditionally in your mind, or at least in my mind, it comes back to a lot of the, you know, the, the tired pea gravel, I call it tired looking pea gravel sidewalks and, and driveways because there's so many of them. But just understand that there's, there's lots and lots of decorative aggregates available out there. And, and fortunately in our region, it's a very good source of it out of the central Texas area. In addition to things like glasses and so forth. So we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in this. These give you a pre-aged or a pre-worn look. There's, there are much less maintenance required than say maintaining an imprinted look. So we think that that's, you know, in large plazas, frankly, they're not as, as busy uh, of a look either. The washed, uh, hand seated and then other washed methods of exposing the uh, aggregates that would be contained in the matrix. This would be an example of that decorative aggregate contained in the matrix of the concrete and then uh, using a surface retarder to kill the hydration of the cement, coming back and, and later removing that cement paste and also doing some decorative scoring to that. So... Uh, you know, different uh, layering, a different level of, des of complexity over the top of that to add more interest to that. And then there's, of course, still other methods to abrade it through sandblasting, water blasting, and shot blasting. Uh, you know, if you had taken uh, the, the focus on this entry here was um, talk a minute about cost, a little bit about cost, because a lot of times, obviously, that, that's what drives in our industry is you're, you're working with somebody on a new building and they want to do an enhancement to the front entry to the building. They don't have a tremendous amount of money, but they want to do something. Well, they were going to spend, let's say, $5 a square foot to get their gray concrete in. So we say, well, let's talk about introducing a color into that, just a light brown or an off or a tan color in that. 
So that might add a dollar a square foot to that. So we've gone from five to six dollars a square foot. And then, oh, let's, let's do a little bit of template sandblasting in that. Add a little, a little bit more interest to a little template sandblasting. In our market, this would add probably another two dollars to two fifty a square foot. So we've taken a, a, a five dollar a square foot traditional four inch thick concrete entry to a building out of great broom finished concrete. Added three dollars to fifty cents to that and get something like this. So, you know, in, in, a, in a focused area like that, a lot of mileage I think that you get out of just, you know, really some fairly inexpensive upgrades. Now, you could obviously add to that complexity, and you could you could further move that price up if the budget allowed for it. But uh, again, you get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of mileage out of that. Other examples of uh, exposing the aggregates in a, uh, a layered uh, beach look. This is all concrete right here. Just your traditional uh, river gravel that's still widely available and readily available in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, as well as most of Texas, I believe. Another example of exposed aggregates with just doing some narrow seeding with some selective aggregates at interest to an architectural concrete installation. And then you see how those Again, we're still looking at the way we affect the texture in the concrete, but we have multiple textures coming together here. We have seamless skins that are that were imprinted onto the concrete to create the, st the stone texture here, and then we're exposing sections of that with just traditional exposed aggregates. And then finally, through imprinting, uh, we saw how imprinting can affect the the pattern in the concrete by the the, the design of the tools, but because most of the imprinting tools today have a dome in them and they have a texture that's built into that, we're also creating t texture in that element as well. So this is a, uh, a random slate texture. Uh, and as you see, these textures can go interior. I'll show you an example of, of this. This is the forum shop at Caesars. I think this thing was built about, it's at least 20 years old, maybe a little older than that. So it's been... And it's a, uh, emulated in a, a Roman cobble street. But those textures can also be carried to the, outs to the outside as well. well. Hopefully we've learned a little bit about the methods to manipulate and affect the color in concrete. We've talked about integral colors, color hardeners, antique and release agents, and chemical stains. Uh, we've touched on the techniques to create pattern in the surfaces, again through exposed aggregates and through imprinting and so forth. And then we touched and we've also looked at the various textures and how we create textures in the concrete. And then hopefully you have an understanding now of how when we talk about a concrete surface design system that's designed with the color, the pattern, and the texture in, in incorporated into that. And maybe as you as you look at that it will help you in the in the future to, to design like that. Any questions? How soon after the concrete is uh, most of the time you're going to want to be 28 days before you can apply that. Um, which, if, if there's a requirement for the project that it be done before that, then, uh, then you can, you could cheat that some by probably, depending in Texas here, I wouldn't hesitate to cheat it by half that time, but I would put an epoxy, water-based epoxy down first to slow down. It's going to be a, a very, it's a very dense concrete, and so, you know, the, the, the chance of delamination would be pretty high if you got, if you did it anytime sooner. So most of the time it, it needs to be well cured. And again, just as you might as think, uh, as, as you probably kind of goes without saying, but, but all of the considerations that you would give to a normal concrete section you would give to this. We're simply talking about special finishes. So all your considerations to subgrade preparation, joint control theory, Thickness, reinforcement, all that st is still in play. Even more so. We may want to realign the joints a little bit, you know, to help it align with the, the design aspect, but, but it's all still in play. Is there any special service preparation that needs to be done to make sure it's bonded? With the microtop, because of the nature of it, it's, we, we generally, the, the, the profile can be actually pretty Mechanical profile can be pretty minor. Uh, so it does get cleaned and prepped through a prep process. So your answer to the question is yes. It doesn't have to be as aggressively prepped as a self-leveler where you got a shot blasted. 
but it does have to be cleaned of, of mastics and glues and things like that. And, and usually we will still use an epoxy, a water-based epoxy as a primer over that, just because it's so thin and to control how quickly the moisture leaves, leaves it. And that also adheres. But it bonds tenaciously. It's, 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 you know, again, that technology's been out there a long time, uh, or has been out quite a while for the development of thin toppings and all those toppings, but it, it bonds very well. No, question? On the color part, color part of the concrete, where you're putting pigment in the atmosphere that's treated. Correct. It still has some lead water at that time, probably. Does that, if you, uh, does it have a problem with getting over on the other concrete adjacent and staining it also? Yeah. The, yeah, the question was, was probably a little bit of two part, but bleed water, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's inherent in the concrete and, and, you know, Leo is trying every day to reduce my bleed water. Leo and Victor both. By water reducing the admixes. But, uh, you actually need a little bit of bleed water, free water in that concrete to react with that hardener, uh, so that I don't find my technicians adding it to the surface. Anytime we pour those colors up adjacent to colors, even if there's not a lot of bleed water, that, that adjacent surface is going to need to be protected, usually through poly uh, and, and through a, a plastic of masking that. Because, you know, even pouring, for instance, crosswalks with gray concrete on each side, we have, we'll mask back about eight feet or so because once, the, you know, those pigments hit it, they're very hard to get off the surface of that. So... That, that, that's an answer to the masking, and, and really if we had a, a lot of bleed water or not, we would still do that. The bleed water how aspect of that, though, we do like to see and do really need a little bit of bleed water in that uh, that concrete because we're putting on cement and pigments that we have to bull float or float into the surface of that concrete. And again, it's always better to, to pull that moisture up out of the concrete to react with that surface hardener. Question? How do you recommend the maintenance to the client? How do they maintain? What's your recommendation? For maintenance? Yeah. Well, a lot of it, for, a lot of these will depend on what, what, the good rule of thumb is, is ease of cleaning and just the aesthetic and, and the, and the look of it. We have people that, we, we also provide a service to go out and clean and reseal a lot of our architectural installations. Most of them, frankly, are done by the engineering staff for the, uh, of, of the building and so forth. But typically it's when it's it starts to become unsightly or starts to be difficult to clean. Okay? If it starts to be becoming more difficult to clean, you know, things stick to it, dirt adheres to it more, there's probably time to give it a thorough cleaning and reapply the sealer. Most of those sealers, you know, will 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 break down under UV or through the elements. So water or things like that will break down your exteriors. On your interiors it's it's the amount of traffic that you, that you get on that surface. You know, obviously a North Park mall is going to be the clean it nightly. Uh, if if we put one of these surfaces in your office in a conference room, you know, you, you might dust mop weekly, damp mop as needed, and you might not have to reapply a wax, but every couple of years or so. So you don't let that guy come into the white and some <laughs> well, we, we, we like to, to put together a, a maintenance manual that kind of tells him what to do, but it's, uh, uh, no, we'll try not to do that. You know, it, uh, uh, we, we were doing a lot of work for a, a na- na- well-known restaurant chain. We couldn't figure out why the sealers were breaking down after about six months. So I said, okay, fine, I'll go, you know, all that cleaning is done, of course, after midnight, you know, at two in the morning. Well, I figured out that, that by the time it got down to cleaning the floors, everybody was tired. And if the Ecolab dispenser said one push for per gallon of water, they figured if you push three times, you get it done in a third the time. So, you know, it was it was extra doses of that detergent that ultimately were breaking down that sealer. So, in answer to your question, there's there's good products, lots of good products out there now to to maintain them with. One more. Yeah, good good question. The question was, how do you repair it? Um, it you know, and it could depend on a, it might depend on a number of aspects. If it was a, uh, without knowing more about the, the details, but say it was an interior stain job, for instance, that had been damaged, 
You probably are going to have to repair color component to color, color component, as we say, or joint line to joint line. It's, it's very difficult to go in and do, say you needed to do, we might add a polymer repair material to it and reintroduce the stain, but it's very difficult to make that all match. So we may have to go joint to joint to do that. On, on a lot of just cast in place architectural concrete, you know, we have technicians that, that can go out and literally if a, a corner's broken off or a piece is chipped out or something like that, can blend those colors with again some polymer materials so that we're we're getting good adhesion and and good durability and go back and, and patch that back in with pretty good success. So a lot of it again it depends on the the, the exact architectural installation, but but there should be good you know there, rarely do we have to go in just for a you know minor damage and say go remove a a, a panel. You know no, normally that's not the case. Well, thank you very much.